thank you very much for the introduction. That's very kind. And yes, I make terrible life decisions. Um, <laughs> surfing in Australia is really nice. I haven't been home for three years since the pandemic, but I will be going home in a couple of weeks, which I'm very excited about. But I'm also very excited to talk to you about maths as well. So um, let's talk about that. What we were looking into when we were starting this project was whether or not we can actually use machine learning to help mathematicians in a way that they would care about. So as Kevin alluded to in his talk, mathematicians are very difficult to impress. <laughs> and we talked to a bunch of people early on, mathematicians, to see whether they thought there would be anything interesting in their day-to-day -day work that you know, machine learning might be able to do. And they kind of kindly showed us to the door or just turned away and looked back at the blackboard and uh, assumed that there really wouldn't be anything helpful that could come out of this. And this is probably a pretty reasonable expectation on their part, uh, because up until maybe the last few years, there hasn't been a lot of contribution of learning systems to the actual work that mathematicians do. So the natural question for a non-mathematician to ask is, what is it exactly that mathematicians do? Uh, and this is a diagram that was written for me by one of our collaborators, Geordie Williamson, who's a fantastic mathematician, uh, to try and give us a sense of what it is mathematicians are doing when they're doing their work. And this is important. Uh, again, Kevin mentioned that computer scientists probably did a little bit of math, but we don't even really know what goes on in an undergrad math curriculum, let alone once you get to the point of doing research mathematics. And so this illustration says, uh, essentially that you start from some kind of state of being totally lost at approaching some area, some kind of structures in mathematics or a problem. And there's a lot of time spent on trying to figure out what is the idea that's go that you're going to pursue in this kind of long branching paths of mathematics that uh, end up being discarded because they're not useful. And this is things that you don't see if you're reading maths papers or listening to maths talks. But there's some kind of true path through here where eventually once you've got a sufficiently concrete idea of a theorem and a proof, it, you can go down to checking the details and eventually get what mathematicians are ultimately usually looking for, which is a theorem. And it's worth saying that as an outsider to this process, I had always kind of assumed that doing maths is a little bit more like doing lean, where you're just kind of sitting through and maybe what you do in high school or undergrad maths, where you just have this kind of statements, you grind through and you write some, some things down. But having the opportunity to play a kind of maths anthropologist and watching mathematicians actually do their work, it's much more uh, of a creative endeavor and much more of this uh, kind of soft thought process that really only comes down to something which is a little bit more formal at the end. And this kind of point on the diagram uh, is kind of where Kevin was talking about. This is where you already know what the proof is. You've gone through this difficult process of, of finding what you're going to do, doing it, and then it's really just a case of the details to something which really, um, you know, we have lean and some excellent systems for doing this with. And what I'm gonna talk about in this part of the talk is where does the idea come from? Is there a way that machine learning can help us in this part of the mathematical process? And so another way to say that is, you know, can we use machine learning to discover patterns in mathematics uh, that can then form the basis for conjectures that are interesting enough for mathematicians to uh, follow and prove. And since all of machine learning is about discovering patterns, then probably we might be able to do something in this area. And this is what we worked on. And this is something that we feel landed really well with the mathematical community because we spent a lot of time trying to meet them uh, where they were and find something that was actually useful for pushing forward um, the areas of maths that we were looking in. So this is just a little bit more uh, emphasis behind the point that I made before, that mathematics is not a kind of uh, deterministic, grinding, writing out a proof. It's a very creative endeavor that involves a lot of different parts of the human brain. And Ramanujan is probably a pretty good example of a mathematician who is particularly intuitive and worked in a way that he saw relationships and talked about uh, theorems or conjectures that he came up with as being brought to him in a dream um, by the, the goddess of his family and that he, in many cases wouldn't even bother to write down the proof because it was just so obvious to him that it was correct. And this isn't really coming from a place of, of rational reason. This feels like it's coming from a very creative and inspired place of just seeing into the, the deeper patterns within numbers. <laughs> 
And so I did not confer with Kevin before this, but he has stolen my two lead-up examples. But you know they're good ones, um, <coughs> and I'm not just making these up. So kind of as we go through a brief history of, of people, this is how people have always done mathematics uh, in a certain way. So this kind of idea of experimental mathematics is that we have the opportunity to look at examples of these objects to try and see what's going on, and then we can formalize these as conjectures and try and prove them. And uh, if we look at the prime number theorem, this is uh, a case of tabulating through tremendous human effort, these manual examples of primes that you can then manually look at and see what the, the pattern is. The BSD conjecture is taking a great step forward in saving human suffering because we're calculating all these examples with a computer now. People don't have to be sitting up all night with their pen and paper um, doing this process, but the pattern discovery is still manual. You, you still have uh, Birch and Sweeney and Dyer trying out a few of these elliptic curves, trying to see what looks good and, and noticing this pattern themselves that they then formalize in the conjecture. And so what we're doing in this work is taking the next natural step, which is that we can offload this to the computer as well. We can ask the computer to not only calculate examples, uh, but we can ask it to look for the patterns as well. And as we have gone from the 60s into 2020, this is an increasingly useful thing for us to be doing because uh, if we look at these L functions, we don't have 30 of them, we have 20 million of them. And there's no mathematician in their right mind is gonna sit down and look at 20 million uh, L uh, functions. Uh, and there are also examples where even a single example might be sufficiently large that it's very, very difficult for a person to look at a, a single example and try and have a sense of what's going on. Uh, and I'll show you something which is a little closer to that uh, as we go on. Uh, so this is another, <laughs> this is another historical um, table of prime numbers. Um, I, this is counts of the number of prime numbers in different ranges of a thousand. So this is going all the way up to a million. And yeah, this is just a tremendous amount of work. And there's a quote here uh, about this, but it just shows that conjectures in these days were rarely idle guesses. They were supported by these huge piles of laboriously gathered evidence of, um, of computers or grad students or whoever they're using to do these calculations. But the process worked and they were able to uh, come up with these conjectures for really fundamental problems. Uh, here's a couple more pictures, one of Birch and Swinnerton Dye and one of that computer. This is, I think, just one part of the computer being um, removed or reinserted after um, a technician's been looking at it, that they then program up to calculate all of these um, data points that they used to um, determine this pattern. So as a flowchart of how the mathematicians and computers are working together in this case, we're taking a very simple, small slice of what a mathematician's work could be. And in this case, we're looking for uh, examples where a mathematician thinks a function might exist, but they don't know what that function is. And this is the kind of task that a machine learning system is really well set up to solve. So if you're going to try and say, find a function, between um, an input and an output data set. We need to generate a data set. We can train what we call in machine learning a supervised model. So ask the, the system to try and optimize the function to as well possible match the output given only the input. And this in itself can be a useful, helpful, quick turnaround tool for a mathematician to say like, ah, oh, it seems like a simple function might exist here. And we can just ask the computer to check that for us. But when it comes to for conjectures, we'll normally want to know something a little bit more about the function. And this is not something we necessarily get for free if we're using more sophisticated um, algorithms for function approximation than linear regression. If we're using neural networks or something like this, uh, we, can use, we can still use techniques like attribution techniques to try and understand part of what's making this function work. How will we able to make this prediction of, of one thing from the other? And then we can just hand this information back off to the mathematician, get them to understand the problem a little bit more deeply, go through this in a few times in the loop and hopefully get something useful out in the end. So I will start with a, a very, very contrived example of uh, trying to learn if there's a function that maps from the output of a CCD array pointed at something to whether or not an object is in this image. This is something that's pretty familiar to you, but you know, think of this in a math way. Say we didn't know that such a function exists. We didn't know that if we pointed a camera at something that we'd then be able to tell what's in the image. 
how would we be using this tool of learning the function and then using attribution to try and understand what's going on in images? So that's a cat. Everyone has already recognized that. And hopefully you're all familiar with the fact we can do image recognition pretty well with a neural network. So if we were to give it these images and inputs and then tell it what is in the uh, image as an output, it can give us some predictions of probabilities of what classes is present in this, uh, in this picture. And if we were able to train this model, we would see that we could learn a function that seems to be doing a very good job. So it does seem like there's a function that exists taking the input pixels and predicting whether or not there's a cat there. And we can also do this by holding out some of the examples. We can show it ones that the model's never seen before. And if it's consistently getting the right answer, then we will be increasingly convinced that it's learned a correct function uh, and not just memorized the data that we showed it. And so what we can then do is attribution. We can say to the network in a very simple way, given that you've made this prediction that there's a tabby cat present in this picture, why did you make this decision? And since this is a math talk, what we can do is we can take the gradient of this prediction with respect to the input pixels. So we can look at this and say, which of the pixels, if I changed it, would most change your opinion on what's in the image? And then we hope that ones that change a lot are the pixels that are being used by the network to make this decision. And so we can kind of do this, and you get not a perfect but a pretty good idea of which of these pixels the network has looked at in some, in some sense to make the decision, yes, there is a cat in this image. So if we try and move that slowly over to the realm of related to what we're actually talking about today, um, I'm going to give you another potentially easy example depending on um, how much maths you've done in your life. Uh, and this is whether we can rediscover something called Euler's formula. And so can we give the network uh, some information about polyhedra and uh, see if we can predict some measurements of it based on another one. So see whether there's a relationship um, on the number of edges in a polyhedra by only looking at other measurements of it. And obviously we know this is the case and we know that there is a formula. So I know that we will find a function if we give it this kind of data, but I'm going to pretend I don't know what it is. And so if we put in the faces, the vertices, the surface area, volume, etc., I could ask a network can you predict the number of edges? Like, is there a connection here um, that you can convince me exists? And if I were to train this network, it would say, yeah, you know what? Given a small number of examples, you show me a bunch of new ones and I'll be able to tell you the answer very, very um, accurately and very consistently. So I can believe this exists, but I still don't know what it is. We can do the same thing as before and ask which of the features are relevant for making the prediction and I assume some people will already know. Uh, it's something to do with the faces and the vertices. Uh, and you can try and figure out the formula in the next kind of 20 seconds before I press the next button. But there's a, a relatively simple formula in this case that will tell you the edges from the faces and the vertices. And we could have actually just done this pretty effectively by using linear regression because there is a, a linear function. Turns out it's the number of faces plus vertices minus two. But this was a simple case. Life is not linear. Usually, if we're looking for interesting relationships, they're not going to be linear, and so you would not find it with linear regression. You need some function estimator, uh, which can do a little bit better than that. So we managed, the interesting thing from what we actually did was that we, we worked together with some very excellent mathematicians, so with Geordie Williamson on the right uh, in representation theory, and then Andras Juhasz and Mark Lackenby uh, in topology, uh, in knot theory in particular. And we worked with them to try and find out where would it be interesting to find these relationships? Where might there be interesting relationships just sitting there to be found that we haven't noticed or mathematicians haven't noticed because it lies just a little bit outside of the general perception level if you're looking at not tables, which is something that not a lot of people do, but some do. And so I'll start with the example of knot theory. <coughs> So knot theory is the mathematical study of these objects, so knots, which are exactly what you would think of as knots if you were tying your shoe, except that they're actually a closed loop, so the kind of ends are glued together. And once you've done this, you've created this topological object where you can kind of move it all around, and if it's like this, you'll never be able to untie it because it's kind of connected around itself, but the way that it loops in and around itself 
uh, is very interesting and kind of gives rise to very interesting mathematical structures and, and questions to investigate. And knot theory, low dimensional topology and knot theory in particular is a very computationally mature field. So there's a lot of software which is very good for working with these knots. And they've generated a lot of knots tables uh, of interesting invariants from which a lot of conjectures have come out. So this kind of very traditional method of data-driven discovery. Uh, and there's been a lot of really interesting connections. So there's, uh, I guess famously, Chern Simon's theory connects knot theory with quantum field theory. Uh, there's connections between knot theory and geometry and hyperbolic geometry in particular, which is one of the things we're gonna be interested in. Um, and then also more kind of algebraic structure that you can place on top of the knots. So it's this kind of intersection point between different areas of mathematics. And this is often something which is interesting to mathematicians is finding ways to connect otherwise disparate areas of maths, of which again, the BSD conjecture is a good example. And so when we asked, they said, okay, Mark and Andres, uh, where would there be a connection? If we found something that would be really interesting, I said, well, obviously between the geometric structure and the algebra of knots would be huge. There's only one conjectured relationship known as the volume conjecture. And up until now, no one's noticed anything else. So don't expect to find anything because if there's anything there, I'm sure somebody would have noticed it in the last 30 years, but we will humor you. Please go away and train the network and see if you can find anything. And in order to do that, we take just a list. This is kind of simple stuff. We just take a list of these geometric quantities. Um, and in this case, we try to predict the signature, which is a kind of very fundamental, one of the first invariants that you would learn about in knot theory, which it comes from this algebraic world. So kind of, there's no clear reason that these should be connected directly, aside from the fact that we know they both are generated from the same fundamental object from the same knot. And so this is what this actually looks like. So we have our, um, a table here of three different knots. And on the left, you can see an image of the different ways you can take a string and tie it up in such a way that you, you, know, you couldn't take any of these knots and then twist them up into one another. They are distinct objects. And then you can make these different measurements of them. And the geometric invariants are usually real numbers. They're kind of like the volume measurements of different parts of it. And then these are the algebraic invariants, which tend to be integers or polynomials. And so we just said, okay, can we just take an off the shelf neural network and predict the signature from the geometric invariants? Uh, and then once we've done that, the answer is yes, as you might guess. And we can perform that same attribution technique, this kind of saliency analysis to ask which parts of the geometry were responsible for controlling the signature. And so we can just hand back this, this graph here and say, look, I don't know what any of these words mean, but almost certainly these top three things um, are all contributing very strongly to prediction. They all look kind of similar. They're all something about translation and meridional something. So Mark puts his hand over his forehead and it's like, fine. <laughs> I'll go away and see if we can understand what's going on here. And this, yeah, I should emphasize this was very surprising. This was something is like, I don't have any idea how this could be true, but I'm gonna take it on faith that it is and let's see if we can do something here. Uh, and after some amount of thinking, he said, okay, there's actually a, a reasonably natural quantity if you understand what you're measuring here, which we're now gonna call the slope. We're gonna call the natural slope of a knot and it's, we take these three quantities and we just add them in a certain way. Uh, we combine them in a certain way uh, to get the slope. And then we could look at this and conjecture that actually it looks like the slope and the signature are linearly related up to some, again, reasonable bound based on Mark's understanding of knots. Uh, and it turned out this was wrong. Um, so we sent <laughs> Mark and Andrew says, we saw that kind of branching path. We sent them running off down this. I, that's unfair to say we sent them running. They came up with this conjecture and then ran down that path uh, for a reasonable amount of time until they were able to come up with a counterexample to this conjecture. So that conjecture is not in fact true. Uh, but that was the last piece that was required uh, to modify this conjecture uh, to involve another term, which actually you can take either of these next two ones that we ignored uh, and use it to correct the bound such that this is, this is correct. And they actually went through and proved both of these versions of the conjecture. And so this, is, this was then the first proved connection between these two otherwise disparate areas of knot theory, um, which uh, we've published recently in Geometry and Topology, just for the mathematical results. 
um, to kind of show this is something that that community cares about and that we can do it with relatively, we can find this connection with relatively simple tools for machine learning. The second example um, that we have is representation theory. And so we did this, this work and we, we kind of found this connection. It was very surprising. And then when I asked, I showed this to Jordi, I was like, okay, is there anything that's like this in your area of, of mathematics? Because I don't know, uh, maybe this is just constrained to topology. Um, but he was like, yeah, you know, there's these, there's these objects. Uh, I'll draw one for you. He's a very good drawer. Um, and they're called uh, Bruhar intervals. And there's a question about them that I think we might be able to, to get into using these techniques. And so I'm going to try and spend a tiny bit of time building up to what a Bruhar interval is. Hopefully this is what you signed up for when you came for a, uh, a lecture on maths and machine learning. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go into permutation groups. So uh, one object we have are permutations. So this is the ways to reorder the elements of a list. So if we had five things, I could say to you three, two, four, one, five, and that means take the first element, put it in the third spot, keep the second one in the second spot, uh, third one to the fourth, and, and so on, and you kind of move them around, and that I've taken something and then I've just swapped the elements around and that's applying a permutation to it. And so the, the objects that Geordie cares about are called coxeter groups, and uh, we can describe these in terms of a subset of the transformations. So for the permutation groups, uh, there's a, a small number of them that we care about called the reflections, which are just any time you take a big list and you just swap two of the elements around. So if we had only four elements, there are six reflections where we take those four elements, leave two of them where they are, and then swap the remaining two. And then once you have that set of operations, you further look at the simple ones. So what they call the simple reflections are the ones where you just swap the neighbors. So you just swap one and two, leave three and four constant. Uh, in the next one, you swap three and two around. And so this, you have the, all of the reflections here where you're swapping two elements. And then the ones in blue are the ones where you're just swapping the neighbors. And if you take these, it, I mean, that's a fairly simple description. If you take these, you can kind of generate these very deep and interesting objects um, that kind of say something about these symmetries. And you can then use as the basis, it's really kind of sits at the very basis of this field called representation theory, which I didn't know existed before I talked to Geordie, but this is, this is a very fundamental and interesting area of maths. Um, so if we think about these permutations, each as a node in the graph, we can generate a graph by just drawing an edge between two nodes if, if they're connect, if you can take them and then just perform a swap to go between them. And we kind of start from the, what you call the identity permutation, which is one, two, three, four, like a fully ordered list. And then we're gonna use these uh, reflections to go up and generate this kind of interesting graph with kind of subtle structure to it. And kind of proceed upwards in a way which is not, uh, we don't need to be too precise about, and you generate something which looks like this. And we have kind of uh, either solid lines, I think for the general reflection, no, solid lines for the simple reflections, and then dotted lines uh, for the non-simple reflection, for the remaining ones. And this is pretty much the simplest Bruhar interval that you can draw. So with, with all of that, this is, this is the bunch of graphs that Geordie spends a lot of his life looking at. And there is this really fundamental conjecture called the combinatorial invariance conjecture, which has been around for 30 or so years. And it says that Given uh, two elements in a Coxeter group, so two permutations, you have this big graph, and then you also have a polynomial that you can calculate from these two things. And if we've got that graph before, and we've got all the labels, so like I know what the reflections are on the edges, or I know what these labels on the nodes are, there's a, a relatively simple algorithm I can use to calculate the polynomial. If I take all of those away, and I get rid of the labels, uh, then it's not known if there's an algorithm for calculating the polynomial. Geordie so strongly, and many so strongly suspect there does exist one, but they don't know what it is. Um, so this is, I say, even 50 years, and so this was conjectured by Lustig and Dyer that these two objects are fundamentally related, but they don't know what the function is that maps from a graph to the polynomials. So this is starting to look a little bit like what we were doing before. The objects are starting to get more complicated, but the premise is the same. 
we have this big uh, graph of permutations, and the question is, does there exist a function to predict the polynomials? And this is another uh, illustration of a Bruhar interval, and that is the first example of a graph that doesn't just have uh, a, this kind of simple polynomial, isn't just essentially one. So this is the first non-trivial example of a Bruhar graph, uh, and it's got a kind of Q-squared term. And if you want anything more interesting than that, they grow very, very quickly, and they grow very, very large, such that even a single example is unreasonable to expect even Geordie to look at and understand anything that's going on. So now we have a large data set of interesting mathematical objects that are also very large and difficult to deal with. And so we need some way to try and use machine learning to simplify this down so Geordie can actually see what's going on, what's interesting here, and can we come to a conjecture of what this uh, functional form is. So I'll go through a quick interlude of, you know, how do we run a neural network on graphs? So I'm assuming that many people may have already seen, you know, the general idea of a neural network before. You kind of put in some information, multiply it by a big matrix, put it through a nonlinearity, do this a bunch of times, and then you make a prediction. But it may be less clear, what are we doing if we're doing this on a graph or something more interesting? Um, in this case, we would have inputs on all of the nodes of a graph. So here's an example graph. Uh, and a node in that with its neighborhoods, so the, the nodes that it's connected to. And we would take all of the inputs on the nodes and we'd run them through neural networks separately uh, to create what we would call a latent or an embedding. So you kind of let the network think about what's going on in a particular node and then give it a kind of space to save some information of what it's figured out so far. Uh, and the next step is that you can take the um, information that's stored in the neighbors of a particular node, send that to the node that you want to update, and then put this through a neural network to let it think about what's going on in the current node as well as the neighbors to update you know, what it kind of believes about what's happening in this particular node. And we can do this a bunch of different steps of this, and it looks like pa passing messages on a graph. So you kind of calculate things locally, pass the messages around the graph so it's got a sense of what's happening in its neighborhood. And then in the end, uh, you can classify what's going on in particular nodes by taking a latent and predicting through a neural network or another function uh, something based on that latent. We can aggregate a function across all of the nodes so that we can make a prediction about the graph overall, which is what we'll be doing. Um, or you could also predict uh, something between pairs of elements you can take uh, say predict whether an edge exists by taking the two latents at these sides and then making a prediction through a neural network. So in this case, what we want to do is uh, input this uh, Bruhar interval that we showed you before, and then we want to make a prediction of a polynomial out at the end. So we're going to make some predictions of like, okay, I think the first term of the polynomial is this, I think the second term of the polynomial is this, and so on. Um, and this is the nice simple version of that. Big black box in the middle, can we predict this? Uh, and it turns out that in the data set that we had, which was an enumeration of all of the Bruhag intervals up to a certain size, we were able to do this with a suspiciously high confidence. We can do this very, very well for examples we've never seen before, uh, which implies that a function probably exists and probably it's not too complicated. You know, there's a, a s only a certain set of functions that a neural network will be able to replicate efficiently given the training setup. So this gives us a really good amount of confidence that a function does exist. And I want to say again that this can just be this bit of information that a mathematician needs, that kind of confidence for them to go charging off down the path that otherwise they might not have. It's, it's a lot more scary to kind of spend a lot of your mental energy investigating something which is ultimately going to be unproductive, but this is some good evidence that something is happening here. Um, but we can always take that step further. We can take the learned function and try and you know, tease some information out of it. Um, and we can use the same kind of techniques. It gets a little harder and a little bit more difficult to interpret the results as we're looking at graphs and we're looking at more complicated functions. Um, but we can still show Geordie some pictures that mean something to him. <laughs> and you can kind of take these really big graphs which just have edges going everywhere. You can't even see them when they're rendered. And we can try and say, well, well, if we kind of had to get rid of a bunch of the edges and just leave a few in there, these are the ones that seem to capture a lot of the important information. And so 
We were able to show him lots of different graphs of these kinds of some other kinds. Some were helpful, some weren't super helpful. Um, but I think the process was good. We kind of worked through this together and figured out some motifs that seemed very relevant, inspired by theory. So things that Geordi realized based on other work should be relevant and we could annotate for the network, which makes the network's task easier. Um, but ultimately, one of the most helpful um, things that we ended up looking at was a plot like this where we aggregated across the whole data set, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, across the whole data set, which of the edges uh, were being kept, which ones were relevant for the predictions and which ones weren't. Uh, and it turned out that if we look uh, across the bottom and the, the left side, any, in this case, this is for permutations of length nine, any of the reflections that had zero or eight in them were much more common than one would expect by chance. And the simple reflections that I told about before, the ones that have neighboring uh, elements, turned up much less often. And so the simple reflections, maybe that's fine. Like we already knew they were important and that might have something to do with the fact they turn up less often. Uh, the fact that the extremal reflections, the ones that were referring to these kind of on the edge reflections turned up so often uh, seemed odd. And so I showed this to Jordan, he, Jordy and he told me this is garbage and we ignored it for a couple of months. But eventually, <laughs> we came back to it uh, and he said like, oh, you know what, I thought about this a little bit more and actually, there could be a reason that these extremal reflections are, are important in this problem. I'd never thought about this before. I've never seen anyone talk about this. And uh, essentially, armed with this knowledge and you know, a very small amount of direction in a vast mathematical landscape, uh, Geordi said, okay, well, actually, it turns out that if we just look along the extremal reflections, we can separate this graph into two bits. And I understand those two bits a lot better than I understand the whole thing. Uh, and those two bits are kind of illustrated here. So on one side, you have an inductive piece. So you have a Bruja graph that actually lives in a smaller symmetric group. So it's kind of one from the level below. Uh, and then you have the bit that's connected by extremal reflections, which is a, is a hypercube-ish piece. So it has a very kind of particular structure that is nice to work with. And so throughout all of this, uh, we were able to prove that if you only know the extremal reflections, there is an algorithm that calculates these uh, polynomials for us. And Geordi put forward this conjecture that, uh, which we've verified as large as we can, which doesn't say it's true, but it's at least interesting. Uh, th this formula works for any decomposition which um, obeys some pretty basic properties that we know the ground truth one obeys. And, and this is what he kind of came up with at the end. And so I think given that we are meant to be going to a coffee break around now, I'll kind of wrap this up. Um, and I just want to say that the most important part uh, of doing this work, for, I guess for me in a way, was understanding what is it the mathematicians are even doing and trying to show that there are small amounts of uh, parts of maths where it just really makes sense to be using machine learning. And what was very reassuring to me is that in the case of the knot theory, I think it's really shows that there's low hanging fruit that you have in the case of the knot theory, a, a fairly simple functional form for a relationship that involves only three variables that you will not see if you look at any two pairs of them. You really have to be looking at all three of them and just twist it around slightly to notice that relationship is there. And that's enough for everyone who's been doing low dimensional topology and looking at these tables for the last 30 years to just have not noticed it. And it's just kind of sitting there waiting for that pattern recognition. Um, if we look at the example with Geordi, I think this gives us a new axis along which we can uh, kind of use computer aided perception to see what's going on. And I think talking to Mark and Andras and to Geordie afterwards, it was simultaneously uh, an incredibly exhilarating and liberating and frustrating experience of, of working together, being able to have these surprising patterns thrown at them, but also still having to use so much of their mathematical uh, genius really to understand what's going on. Uh, but I think it's a really great first example of how we can take these tools of machine learning and have it be useful for mathematicians and mathematics in general. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.